On those Ed Sullivan shows, I began to realize, uh, not just there, everywhere, all these shows, I didn't fit. And here's what I was missing. I was missing who I was. I began with a dream of being Danny Kaye, which is a very mainstream dream. It's very middle America. It's a people pleaser job. And I dreamed a path that was traditional. Comedian, uh, disc jockey, comedian, actor, big success. A mainstream dream. Meanwhile, what I really was, was an outlaw and a rebel because I had lived that kind of life. I got kicked out of three different schools. I got kicked out of the Air Force. I got kicked out of the choir. I got kicked out of the altar boys. I got kicked out of summer camp. I got kicked out of the Boy Scouts. And I quit school at ninth grade. I had great marks. I was a smart kid, but I didn't care. They weren't teaching what I want. I didn't give a shit. It's important in life if you don't give a shit. It can help you a lot. So I didn't give a shit. And I was this kind of, I was a pot smoker when I was 13. We broke the law, we broke into cars, we broke into offices, we broke into Columbia University, we broke into stores. We did all sorts of unlawful things. And I was that kind of person. I was one who swam against the tide of what is expected and what, is, uh, what the establishment wants from us. But I didn't know that about myself, because this dream blinded me. This dream was about America, about the path that we all follow, the middle of the road, middle class, America, mainstream, will dream. And, and being, meanwhile, I'm sitting there like this, you know, fuck those people. Fuck that shit. Look at this stupid shit. No, I don't want to be in the bunny number. Can I get out of the bunny number, please? I don't want to put on that fucking <laughs> uniform. You know, and, and, and I didn't know this dissonance was inside me, and... In the period this is happening, all through the 60s, the counterculture was forming. The free speech movement started in Berkeley. The hippies were growing into a force. And peace, love, power, love, flower power, pot smoking, anti-authority. See, bing, 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 anti-authority. Throw over the establishment. Burn down the math building? Wow! Ding, 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 ding. So I gravitated toward that because I was that person, really. And, and the people I hung around with were that way. The, the musicians I knew in the late 50s had gone through that transition. Suddenly they looked different, and their music changed. And I'm listening to people like the Buffalo Springfield. I'm listening to Bob Dylan. I'm listening to these people, and I realize these artists are using their talent to project their feelings and ideas, not just please people. Mm -hmm. And I began to take some acid and some mescaline. I didn't overdo it. I didn't have a couple, I had a couple of trips that weren't the best, but I had a lot of great trips. And that is a values changing drug. Hallucinogens are a value changer. So is marijuana. Like it or not, it changes your values. It, it, it opens up windows, doors of perception, Aldous Huxley called them. And you see things differently. And I suddenly was able to see my place and to realize I was in the wrong place. You see, in 1967, the summer of love, the peak of the hippie movement, I was 30. I was entertaining people in nightclubs who were 40. And they were at war with their kids who were 20. There was a generation war. I was in the middle of it. I was 30, 20, 40. And I'm going, I said, what the fuck am I doing over here? These are the people that will at least understand me and give me a chance. So it took two years. I didn't go to the mountain and come back different. I didn't do a Bobby Darren. I didn't do a whatever you know, those people who just go away and they're back new suddenly. I took two years to change, and it happened on television. Mm -hmm. Happened on daytime television. Happened on syndicated shows like Della Reese, Virginia Graham, and Steve Allen had one of his many incarnations. He had so many great shows. This was one of his syndicated shows in Hollywood. And I went on there. Those shows had five shows a week. To need, they needed people. I went on there. My beard was growing and growing, getting longer. My clothes were changing. My attitudes, the things I was allowing out of me were changing. And I talked about my changes on the panel a lot. Virginia Graham loved it. Virginia Graham had Henry Mancini on with me one time. And he had admitted to smoking pot, <laughs> you know? And I just thought that was great. Henry Mancini smoked pot, whoa! And Virginia Graham was a real shit stirrer anyway. She loved to stir the shit, and I loved that. And I'd talk about these things that I felt and what I, these stupid shows I'd been doing. 
And, and Steve Allen was nice. And Steve Allen told me something. I, he was always on there, and he was big with a bowl of fruit, and he always had a bowl of fruit. And I'm eating a plum in between uh, commercials or tape stops. I'm eating a plum. And I said, you know something, Steve? I said, isn't it interesting that the meat of the plum is really sweet, but when you chop down on the skin itself, there's this bitter, sour taste there. He said, that's a poet's thought. I thought, wow. He told me I was a poet. And, uh, and, and just, I was, I was just, I was just expanding. I was just expanding naturally. It wasn't forced. It was organic. It, it was who I really should have. Yeah, who knew? Who knows before the fact? You don't know that. I mean, there's no place like the counterculture in 1960 for me to identify with. I knew about folk rooms. That's why I went to the folk clubs to go to the hootenannies. I knew the pot smokers were in the folk rooms. So it was, it, I, had, I had denied that part of myself and finally it came into full flower. And I never became a really big success until that. Mm -hmm. I probably had uh, 200 television appearances by that time. And I still wasn't realized as a, as a writer, comedian, as a comedian. I, I, by that I mean I hadn't let myself grow into that. And, and I found out later I, I was more than just a comedian. Right, you found your identity. Yeah, I did. And then, then slowly, and I really didn't find my comic voice until 1992, if you want to talk about milestones. Uh, I read something when I was still a comedian in the, in the Greenwich Village, a friend of mine, Bob Altman, uh, not Robert Altman, Bob Altman. He told me about Arthur Kessler's act of creation. And in the uh, act of creation, Arthur Kessler, I don't remember the details of this well enough to do it justice, so I'm going to have to shorthand it to the part that meant something to me. He showed a triptych, a three-paneled illustration. And one of the li and there were several listings down, several listings in, in the vertical column, each of them. And, and th then, of course, you could go look across from one triptych to the second to the third. And that was the progression of a creative person. And the jester was in the first triptych. And the jester is, of course, a person who makes jokes. He makes these funny jokes. But if he has ideas attached, if the jokes are built on sound ideas, if there's something philosophical in his thinking that the jokes illuminate, then he's a bit of a philosopher, too. So he goes to the second part of the triptych. Jester becomes just a philosopher now. And if he does those things with marvelous language, language that thrills us, particularly graceful combinations of words and runs and rhythms of language, then he becomes a poet as well. And so the jester has become a philosopher poet, and he's all one. And I read that very, at a very young period before my development really kicked into gear, and yet somehow it stayed with me. And I think I have now I think I can now do a little justice to that theory. I think I can claim to have my, my essay, their essays now, they, there are sound ideas in them. The jokes are great. I would never run from jokes. Joke, 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 joke. I love big jokes. I love fat jokes. I love home run jokes. And I just put in five or six more the other day in this piece that's almost finished. And I love the jokes. But the jokes are there to uh, decorate the ideas. The ideas are about what I don't like in this country, what it is I'm sort of kind of disenchanted by in my fellow man, my fellow human, and my fellow American. So those are the ideas. But then I, can, I found that I have this ability my father had to be really good with language and to put it into kind of interesting sounding bits and snatches and runs and trills and things. And so I've kind of gotten that. I mean, I, I kind of have inherited that. And, and now I feel fully realized as a performing writer See, I used to think of myself as a writer, as, as a performer who wrote his own material. I always bragged about that in interviews. I'd say, I write my own material, because a lot of comedians didn't. I'd say, I'm a, I'm a comedian, but, but I write my own material. Now I think I'm a writer who performs his own material. I write, but I have two places for it, books and on stage. And then on stage, it becomes HBO. HBO saved my creative, uh, <clears throat> my creative and commercial, the marriage of the two. Yeah saved me because my record career had f pretty much died down i had four gold records in the early 70s and you can't be the new hot guy in town forever so i began to fade and then run out of ideas i drifted a while hbo came along in 77 
I did my first show for them. They didn't have many subscribers. 78, I did another one, and I was on my way. I've now done 13 of them, and number 14 is coming. And that is what has kept me in front of a mass audience without censorship. I don't mean just fuck shit and piss. I mean ideas that would be unwelcome on commercial enterprise television. Mm -hmm. Because commercials, it's, it's in the word. It's a commercial enterprise. They can't allow you to be upsetting the customers. No, no, no. Can you soften that a little? I don't do that. I mean, I, I do The Tonight Show occasionally. I do Letterman occasionally just to plug a new thing that came out that I want to plug. Mm -hmm. And I work on some things for them that are, that are good from the panel, you know. But uh, HBO without, without commercials, boy, that saved my ass. And it, made, it really made me who I am. It, it allowed me to continue working 200 days a year or 100, however many I was well, well enough to do. And that forced me to write. Every time an HBO came around, I'd throw the show out and I'd write another one. I became a writer because of HBO. It's a weird life, you know. Right, and to be able to do those extended, hearing you talk about, you know, the, the jester, philosopher, poet, I thought of that, the opening monologue of one of those specials, Modern Man. Yeah. The, and it's, it's a rap. I yeah, mean, it's a, yeah. It's it is, it's a rap poem. Yeah, it's, and it's all about language and mm -hmm. it's all about jargon, really. American jargon in this uh, this decade, let's call it. Yeah. And uh, I'm a modern man, a man for the long name, digital and smoke free, a diversified multicultural postmodern deconstructionist, politically, anatomically, and ecologically incorrect. I'll do a short part of it for you. I've been uplinked and downloaded. I've been inputted and outsourced. I know the upside of downsizing. I know the downside of upgrading. I'm a high tech low life, a cutting edge, state of the art, bi coastal multitasker, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. I'm new wave, but I'm old school. And my inner child is outward bound. I'm a hot wired, heat seeking, warm hearted, cool customer, voice activated and biodegradable. I interface in my database. My database is in cyberspace, so I'm interactive, I'm hyperactive, and from time to time, I'm radioactive. That's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great piece to do, and I, for some reason, can't forget it now. It's, it's no, lodged it's, in my memory. 